my great pleasure to welcome Tara Yasseri, um, who's a professor of sociology um, at the School of Sociology and, and also the, the Geary Institute of Public Policy. Um, he has worked before um, becoming a professor there. He has worked at the University of Oxford, um, at the Alan Turing Institute, I guess, yeah, and also at the Wolfson College. Which is also close to London. Part of Oxford. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. So, exactly. And uh, Taha has a interestingly, he has a PhD in, in physics, in complex systems physics. And it's funny when you when you look at his uh, Google Scholar profile, you can also kind of um, pin down the, the transition when it happened. <laughs> so I went back to uh, 2010. Where you were dealing with, I think, like growing nano wires on solid surfaces, and then just one year later, it was about um, analyzing edit wars on Wikipedia. So that's kind of a, a jumpy transition. Um, and since that very successful transition that gives people like me a lot of hope, um, he's been working on um, yeah, analyzing a lot of different like collective human dynamics, but he's also um, been zooming in into like individual dynamics and like the recent preprint that I came across um, was a very nice study of the Wikipedia game where you let people play the Wikipedia game to analyze um, how different age groups and gender groups and people with different political affiliations, how they would navigate information spaces. And I think that aligns a lot with research that is partly done at our center and also like it's very close to my heart, like to investigate how, how people explore cultural spaces um, online, but maybe also offline. Um, so that's really cool. And so he's looking into collective dynamics, but also individual dynamics. And crucially, also for this talk, um, he's also been interested in uh, yeah, the sociology in the digital age. And today he's going to talk about um, how humans and machines might um, collaborate, how they might interact, um, and I think you will present results of, of three different experiments that are, on the one hand, like close to field experiments, so rather ecolog ecologically valid, and on the other extreme, like really controlled paradigms from, not from game theory, but from yeah. game theoretical paradigms. Yeah, so, so you have this dimension, but as a sociologist, you're then not only introduced in the dyadic interactions between these people, but also how individual uh, features and attributes affect this dynamic. Um, so I think it couldn't be more relevant and interesting to, to many of us here. So I'm very much looking forward to the talk. And thank after you. that, we, we do the questions. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the great uh, introduction. I didn't know those papers will haunt me, but yes, yeah, some people have good Google skills. Uh, well done, thank you. Now, I, I was uh, doing simulations, multiple simulations on nanowires on the surface of silicon, pretty boring stuff, and um, my simulations would take five minutes to run, and I couldn't do anything in these five minutes windows, uh, just waiting for the result of the simulation. There was not many cat videos on YouTube either, so I started editing Wikipedia also to feel a bit good about how I'm wasting my time. But then I realized, oh, I want to study Wikipedia because uh, all these interactions among editors uh, are fascinating. And that was the jump. Then when I finished my PhD, I was lucky enough to uh, be hired in a project that was called ICT Enabled Collective Behavior, AKA Wikipedia. So anyway, that was the story there. Uh, but uh, funny you should bring that up because this is the first lecture, first talk I think I'm giving my career that has nothing to do with Wikipedia. Uh, I spend a good amount of time looking at thousands and uh, sometimes millions of people working together in a sort of field, and most of my research has been observational. But over the past couple of years, uh, I have become more interested in small-scale collaboration. Well, the smallest scale of collaboration, I think, is dyadic interaction, one-to-one, -one, groups of two. And also, instead of observational studies looking at the existing data, I have become more interested in uh, control experiments or field experiments where they have treatment groups and control groups, and uh, you, can causal you can influence causal relationships much better. 
That was that. I also want to uh, make a disclaimer. These three experiments seem to be connected, but they come from different walks of my life, and I want to demystify academia a bit, because we tend to tell the stories in a way that is coherent, and you might think, oh, this guy had uh, plans for five years of his, vo uh, his work. No. This is random. I put them together today for the first time. Let's see if it works. Uh, and the other thing, the last disclaimer is when we planned this trip, uh, I was a bit too optimistic in terms of hoping that I have even published this work, let alone uh, at the moment, so I'm not even fully finished. Some of the diagrams I'm going to show you today, we are looking at them together for the first time. I received them last night from one of my uh, PhD students, Saida, who is also online. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, so I, uh, my lab is called Sociology of Humans and Machines, which uh, surprisingly has a similar name to where we are, <laughs> only uh, instead of center, it's sociology, but it makes a very nice acronym, SOHAM, which is a Sanskrit word, meaning I am, he, she, that. It's a philosophical concept of being, identifying oneself with the universe, which may or may not be related to the content of the lecture. You would be the judge. Uh, I have been benefiting from a huge uh, funding from uh, Irish Research Council. The title of the project is Artificially Artificial Intelligence Enhanced Collective Intelligence. Basically, in this project, we are looking at uh, two ways that AI could enhance our collective intelligence. Uh, AI as a teammate, uh, we're going to look into the hybrid teams of humans and machines working together, and we are using AI as a team manager. Uh, when we have situations where few individuals have to work together, but then let's say promotion happens or some role assignment is happening, whether we can use AI to make that uh, more effective. Uh, today, I'm going to talk mostly about the right hand side, uh, AI as a teammate, but even before that, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, human teams and teamwork in general. So that would be the first experiment uh, when we have two humans working in the team in the wilderness. I'm going to explain that later. Uh, and that's the work that is actually published, and it was in collaboration with Vincent and Milena. Um, and the paper was published this year in Collective Intelligence. Then I'm going to talk about uh, how two humans can work together online to watch birds, uh, to do bird watching. I explained that. That's a collaboration uh, with Gabriela, Saida, and Margaret. And finally, I'm going to talk about uh, situations when one human and one machine trying to avoid jail. And that is a collaboration with Sepida and Jorgis. And I'm sure some of these faces are familiar um, to you, and um, so the rest are introduced to you. Well, uh, usually people put the name of collaborators on the last slide. Uh, I don't like it because this is really the work that these guys have been doing. Uh, I just uh, take the credit as we do. So let's just start with the first paper and teamwork. Uh, if you Google teamwork or teams, you find all sorts of stock photos. Everyone looks very happy to be in the team. But if you have ever worked in a team, you know that this is not the whole story. We sometimes get really frustrated working with someone else, uh, let alone in a whole team. Uh, we work in a team because there is collective intelligence, because there is wisdom in the crowd. Uh, it has been shown that uh, work done in a team is more accurate, it's more correct, and it's more efficient. That means that you get to the same goal or same quality of results faster. But then there are other issues like uh, social biases or uh, biases that emerge in our collaboration. Herding could happen. Uh, you might just follow others without thinking too much, relying too much on social influence and social information. And when we work in a team, social loafing could happen. Uh, I think someone else will do the job, someone else will check the code, someone else will check for the spelling errors. I'm not gonna need to do it, but then no one does it, and then collaboratively we fail. So there are also disadvantages to working in the team in the previous literature. Uh, and in the kind of pop culture, we have expressions such as two heads are better than one, which promotes and advocates for teamwork, but also we have expressions such as too many cooks spoil the broth, which discourages teamwork. Basically, you need to have one chef, one cook, otherwise 
things could go wrong. I must say it was extremely difficult for me to find this photo to show a bunch of unhappy cooks together, but I managed. Uh, but then immediately you notice the problem here is perhaps lack of diversity in the team, but uh, that's something for another day. So there has been this uh, kind of dilemma in the literature. Should we work together or should we do things alone? To answer this question, we ran a series of experiments uh, and the experiments are kind of field experiments, not as field as these pictures. Uh, so these pictures are automatically taken from a national park in Mozambique called Gorongosa. And there was a citizen science project already up and running in which citizen scientists had to uh, identify the type of animal that they see in these photos. And the data would be collected and used by zoologists to understand how animals are behaving uh, or reproducing in this national park. So we took the same infrastructure, we didn't change it at all, but we invited people to come to the lab um, and we made them to work in groups of two. Uh, so that's, that was the kind of setup of the experiment. And their task was basically to look at these images and identify what animals they see. Okay. However, you might think that's an easy task. It's not. I learned it the moment I started doing because, okay, we might be able to say the difference between an elephant and lion. But if, unless you are an expert or you are interested, it's very difficult to distinguish between different type of goats because they look very similar to unprofessionals or people who are not familiar with, the, with those animals. Uh, so to prepare the participants, we had a training phase. Before the experiment starts, we get them to deal with these animals uh, and we feed them back with the correct answer. However, to half of the participants, we train them with pictures of animals that would also appear in the test. The other half, we train them on a more general, more diverse set of pictures. So they were not necessarily trained for the test, but they were receiving similar training for the same length of time. First, to see if the training was effective, uh, here you see the number of uh, correct answers, correct classifications per minute. Um, this is during the training part, so the, the efficiency goes up. But then the first group, the ones who were trained on the sort of general set, their efficiency drops when the testing part starts. Whereas those who were already trained on the same set of images, their efficiency keeps going up. So it shows that the training is really effective uh, in this situation that we can create two types of people, the ones who are ready to do the test and the ones who are not ready. Otherwise, they are identical. You see multiple lines here because I only mentioned the task of identifying the type of species, but they also had other things. For example, if there is any young animal present or what are the animals doing? Are they sleeping? Are they walking? Are they eating? And uh, how many of them are there in the picture and so on? So we had complex questions and we had simpler and easier questions. So is that clear, the setup of the experiment? So now we have these two types of people well-trained and kind of less well-trained. We call them targeted set people or general set. And then we mix them in groups. We create groups of people who are both well-trained or people who are both not very well-trained and a mixed group. And of course, we keep some people to work on their own as individual groups. So we have these five uh, groups that are uh, taking the test. So the first thing that we observe and this is on the identification of the species, is that compared to a solo person who has the general training, uh, all the other groups, uh, the performance declines when they start working as a team. So this dashed line shows when the teams are formed, and we see that the efficiency declines quite rapidly in the first 15 minutes uh, that they started the, the teamwork. It's very much similar even when we have well-trained people working together. So two diets, the diet of targeted, targetedly trained individuals, the green line, two of them underperform the single well-trained person. 
Okay, there seems to be no benefits whatsoever in having two people working together, and that is independent from the composition of the group. The best performance comes from one person who is well trained, and the worst performance comes from two people working together, none of them is well trained. Okay. And then you can, so this is this diagram shows the efficiency, number of correct classifications per time. Uh, you can look at accuracy alone. Let's say I'm not interested in how fast the tasks are done. I'm only interested in the correctness of the answers. It's more or less the same for the group of people who are not generally trained. Uh, but here again, we see that even when you look at the accuracy, the individual outperforms the groups. Okay. So this basically uh, is the main message here that the cost of coordination among these team members is exceeding the benefit of collaboration. Particularly, it becomes more clear because when you look at the pace of uh, completing the tasks, and we see that these diagrams are very similar to the, the sorry, when you look at the pace, they are very similar to the uh, efficiency diagrams. That means that the main factor that uh, makes teams underperform is the time that they take. They take a lot of time to just make the decision together, to coordinate. Uh, they recover a bit towards the end of the experiment, but at the beginning, this coordination is very costly. Okay. And that makes sense, like almost any other things in social sciences that you see as, yeah, yeah, of course, I, I remember I wanted to do that task and I thought, oh, if I start explaining that to my colleague, it takes time. I'd rather finish it myself. It's quicker and it's faster and it's even perhaps uh, more accurate. So there is a lot more in the paper, but I don't have time. Uh, of course, looking at different tasks and different conditions, things might change a little bit, but the main message is that uh, diet generally only improve performance on uh, when the Sorry, they are gradually improving performance, but do not experience a collective benefit compared to individuals. Uh, at least in short time periods, none of the themes outperformed the individuals. Okay. That was the first experiment. The second experiment is related to Twitter, X, whatever you call this platform. I didn't want to look that cynical, but um, I found this online and I thought I can use it. But I didn't know what logo to put there to talk about Twitter or X, because the data that we have is from the time that it used to be called Twitter. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, but in 2001, sorry, 2021, at the time, Twitter introduced a new uh, side project called uh, Birdwatch. And as you can guess, the idea of Birdwatch was to watch birds, aka Twitter users, to see what are they posting and to battle the spread of misinformation. Uh, when Elon Musk bought Twitter and renamed it to X, also he renamed Birdwatch to Community Notes. That's the term that we are using now. Uh, and that's the logo, which remained the same. Uh, so I might be using these terms interchangeably, but you know all the four terms now, Twitter, X, Birdwatch, Community Notes. The idea was very simple. Uh, Wikipedia works, wisdom of the crowd is a thing. Why not asking experienced Twitter users uh, to identify misinformation on Twitter and tag them and collaboratively they can find the, the, most, the most misleading content and then what happens uh, this birdwatch community can write notes to debunk the tweet, and these notes appear next to the tweet. Okay, just out of curiosity, how many of you have interacted with community notes or have seen them next to tweets? Okay, good. I don't need to explain it too much, but this is an example. Amazon tweets something, and then community note users write notes. There could be many of them, and then they also evaluate the notes that are written by each, by others. And for example, this note, by the look of it, already looks much better than this note because it has references and so on. And we see that other bird watchers agree and they have rated this note as helpful. Therefore, when you go to Twitter, and if you happen to be following Amazon, you see the tweet, this note appears underneath of it. So everyone sees 
the context that that treat may or may not be uh, the claims may or may not be true or accurate or out of context or not. That really excited me. Well, I said I'm not going to talk about Wikipedia, but as a Wikipedia fan and someone who always wondered how come Wikipedia works, but social media do not work, this seems to be a very interesting case that you now they are trying to use community collaboration to fix social media. So I uh, got the data. Uh, around 2,000 tweets, around 6,000 notes written about those tweets by around 3,000 bird watchers who also have voted on each other's notes around 36,000 times. You build a network. Each node here is a bird watch user, and the links are how much they agreed with each other notes. Okay, uh, and the links are weighted. And you can run simple community detection algorithms and immediately, quite easily, you find two big communities of bird watchers that agree with one another a lot more than they agree with the notes that are written by members of the other community. Any guesses who these two communities are? Excellent. Yes. Uh, we don't know, we didn't check, but uh, it's quite clear that that's the case. It was checked later by other people. Just one question, yeah. very quickly. you don't have antagonistic links, you don't have, you only have positive links. No, we do have, but not in this image, okay. because it's difficult to deal with negative ties okay. at the same time. But yeah, this image is very similar to that famous image uh, that is built a few years ago, which shows the polarization among Twitter users. We see more or less the same polarization appears even among birdwatch users. And that was not good news because birdwatch users are supposed to be objective. They are experienced, trusted users who have to be better at leaving their political affiliations or interests behind and try help the project. But this doesn't seem to be working very well, or at least not at the time that I collected this data. Uh, so we wrote a paper with uh, Phil Mansler, who was the PI of that project. Uh, a sh it's a short comment on the communications of a ACM, and we basically said, well, that's a good idea. I think crowdsourcing could help, but uh, there are some design issues. This sort of validation mechanism that we have that, okay, someone writes a note on a tweet, and then I have to rate it. This doesn't really encourage collaboration. It's more like a a sort of yeah, validation process. To have, uh, to be able to see convergence of ideas and consensus as we do see in Wikipedia, we need more direct interaction among birdwatcher users, okay? So we just suggested this with a question mark in the title of the paper, but then we had to check that. And this is what we have been doing. Uh, so this is a second experiment where we have people recruited from prolific, and they are given the exact same task. They are giving a tweet, and they have to write a note about it to contextualize that tweet. Uh, however, they can do it alone, or they can do it in a group, in a team of two. Uh, we build the online interface, they arrive, they can chat with one another, and then when they agree on the note, they submit the note, and then we take it from them. So we started with 40 tweets that have very strong Republican or Democrat tendencies. And then when we build the community nodes or birdwatcher teams, we created teams of two Republicans working together, two Democrats working together, and mixed groups. Oops, sorry. We wanted to see if the diversity that we advocate so much for does help here. We expected that the teams of one Republican and of one Democrat write better notes. Of course, the risk here is that conflict appears. Okay, when you have a diverse team, they might start fighting and they, can, they might they have very limited time to write this note. They might not agree on something. We, have, we had some incentivization for them, but it was independent from agreement. They didn't have to agree, okay? So then we wanted to basically see in these situations which notes are the best notes written collaboratively. Okay, is that clear? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Very good question. I get to that. Any other questions? 
So I want you to familiarize yourself with this notation. Uh, if the tweet supports Republican ideology or is coming from, let's say, a Republican politician, there is R, the first letter, and the other two letters describe the composition of the team who wrote the note. Okay? For instance, DRD is a Democratic tweet, and the note written on it is done, it's written by a Republican and a Democrat working together. So, there are different ways of evaluating the quality of notes. Let's just start with simple ones, uh, the length of the note, okay? And for instance, we see that the shortest notes are written by a mixed group on a tweet that is sent by a Republican, okay? I don't know how to interpret that, but generally we see that notes that are written on Republican tweets are longer than the notes that are written on democratic tweets. You might think that because misinformation is more likely to, to, be, to be more mis mis misleading when it comes from Republican Twitter accounts, if you say that, that's perhaps because you are a democratic person yourself. We don't know, but that could be a reason. But the other thing that is very interesting and it appears consistently is that the mixed group seem to be doing a better job when they are debunking the Republican tweet, whereas the mixed group underperforms uh, fully Democrat or fully Republican groups when they are trying to debunk a Democratic tweet. This is the same when you look at the, if they use the hyperlink, if they have cited an external source to debunk the main tweet, we see that the mixed group quite frequently, quite often, uh, work together with bring external sources when they are debunking our Republican groups. Uh, whereas here, the DD do a good job in terms of using external sources uh, debunking democratic truth. When I say good job, you have to take it with a pinch of, a pinch of salt because it's just a number of links. We didn't check the quality yet. Yes. How do you select the groups, Republican, Republican, I mean, Democrat, Republican, in terms of polarization? Were they close or far away from uh, That's a very good question. We have people to self score themselves how Republican they are and how Democrat they are, and we have a spectrum. We haven't looked into that yet. But generally, people self identify as left side of the spectrum or right side of the, right side of the spectrum. Okay, uh, I speed off when you look at the language complexity, uh, how sophisticated is the language? used in these notes. Uh, we see that generally notes that are written on democratic tweets uh, have a higher level of language complexity. So it seems that people use a simpler language to say that this Republican tweet is not true or it's misinformation. But, um, okay, I forgot to say, I didn't forget. If it's all clear so far, I want to add one more ingredient. Yes? What's that? Question about this. Seems like we can Absolutely. So we have some qualitative analysis that come up in a second, exactly for that reason. Yeah, very good point. But one thing I wanted to mention, we also had another division. Uh, we had a treatment, and that was telling people what is the political affiliation of their partner. Okay, if I'm hooked up to work with Fabian, do I know that he's a Republican or Democrat uh, partisan, or I don't need to know that? Yes? One clarification, so what's the like, interaction? Chat. So you're going to have like text. text. Yeah, the, the length you meant, or the mode. Both, mode and like, so just a short period. Yeah, I think it's about four or five minutes, I'm not sure, and then they can chat with one another. And we validated, because some people don't interact and don't engage, we removed those data sets because we could see the chat as well. Uh, so we only kept the data that we could see clear sign of collaboration. And, and how, after chatting, how do they converge on one text? Well, they have a box where they can draft the text, and they are requested to submit the same text. 
And then we check that to some extent. Well, sometimes people make little mistakes. We accepted those texts, but if the texts were not matching, then we consider it as not emergence of consensus. But those cases appeared quite rarely, and they appeared everywhere, regardless of the composition of the teams. So the conflict that we expected to happen or the lack of agreement didn't really emerge. Well, this is a lab sort of uh, online experiment setting, so people really wanted to do the tasks that are given to. So, but back to what I was saying, there is this theory of mind that collaboration improves if we know more about each other. If I know about the cognitive abilities of my partner, I tune my behavior so that our collaboration is more fruitful. So we thought maybe here, if we tell people what is the affiliation of the partner, the collaboration improves. So we have two conditions, show and no show. In show condition, people see the affiliation of the partner. In no show, they have no idea whom they are working with. And we see that almost consistently, the no show group outperform the show group. Basically, people collaborate better. Again, this is only the length of uh, the length and the external source. Uh, people collaborate better when they have no idea what's the affiliation of the partner. So it's the opposite of the theory of mind, not knowing what is my part, who is my partner seems to be helping here. But okay, these are just some uh, simple measures. What we added exactly to answer that question was a third layer where we again recruited people from Prolific and asked them to qualitatively evaluate the helpfulness of the notes, exactly the same way that community notes people get to rate each other's notes. And we recruited, again, Republicans and Democrats. So you can see the notation gets a bit trickier. Republican tweet, Democrat, Democrat team wrote a note, and then a Republican evaluated that note. Uh, this is what we got. These are all the helpfulness rating coming from Democrat raters. And we see that the best notes based on them are the notes that are written by mixed groups on Republican, group, on Republican tweets. Okay. Donald Trump tweeted something. A mixed group wrote a note on it. A democratic person, a person following Democratic Party, finds it very good compared to all the other groups. So the mixed group outperforms both the RR group and the DD group when the tweeting question is Republican, whereas when the tweeting question is Democrat, the DD team seems to be doing a good job if you ask another Democrat. I let this sink a bit. And then when you look at the ratings coming from Republicans, interestingly, the pattern is the same. Here, remember this shape going up, coming down, and then going up, only it's a little bit less exaggerated. It's still coming down, and then it goes down and will come up. This is surprising because a Republican rater found a note written by two Ds on D the best. So there seems to be this sort of asymmetry in the advantage of having mixed groups. When the tweeting question is Republican, mixed group seems to be the best choice. When the tweeting in question is Democrat, DD groups do the best job. Why is that? I don't know because I got these graphs last night. But maybe you can help me understand this more or less consistent behavior. And these shapes are consistent with those kind of numerical easy measures of lens and hyperlinks and so on. Any consequential? I think that it's sort of like the diff I don't know if they are statistically significant, but if it were they don't seem in this case. This one is good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Is helpful. Yes, yes. Everything is helpful. The differences in this case seem to in this case seem to be uh, not that significant, or the effect size is not even that big, even if it's statistically significant. But then in this case, there seems to be a good separation. I forgot to say, this is uh, half of the data that we have. Uh, so we, we are recruiting around 1,800 raters, and this is the data showing actually less than half. It's only data showing around no, about half, thousand raters. 
So I hope these error bars get smaller when we have the full data. And uh, again, the show no show effect uh, appears here again. The no show groups seem to be uh, marginally outperform the show group. So the theory of again our expectation that when people know whom they are working with does not seem to be supported here. Actually, not knowing the affiliation of your partner seems to be helpful. By showing the the ratings, what the composition was. No. But that could be inferred from the content of the note or the tweet. They perhaps could infer it, whereas there is no way to know what is the affiliation of your partner unless you talk to them. So, but yeah, good, good question. Okay, let me talk about the last experiment because I note that I'm running out of time. Uh, so in this last experiment, luckily the setup is very simple. Do I need to explain prisoner's dilemma in this room? You're all experts. The one thing that we added, some of you might not have thought about this, is before we ask people to submit their decision, we ask them what they think is going to be the move of the partner. Okay? Why did we do that? Because it helps us to interpret the decision. If I cooperate, predicting that Fabian is going to cooperate, perfect, mutual cooperation. But if I defect, Predicting that he's going to defect too, I'm defecting because I don't trust him. But if I defect, predicting he's going to cooperate, I'm defecting because I want to exploit him. I know he's going to cooperate, but I don't care because it's a one-shot game. Okay? So we have this sort of matrix. What you do and what you think your partner is going to do, and then this is mutual cooperation, this is mutual distrust. This is exploitation. And we have this sort of independent cooperation. People who cooperate, even though they think their partner is going to defect. It's some sort of, I cooperate no matter what. Uh, we are struggling with the, how to name that. If you have a good suggestion, please share. Uh, we also call it uh, sometime uh, unconditional love or something like that. <laughs> Anyway, so we have this, we can measure all this and see why people cooperate and why people defect. Uh, first of all, the first division we have, we, we got people to play with a human and a bot. The truth is that we didn't have a human or a bot that played the game. We basically generated some actions, uh, but we labeled them as a human as a bot. Okay, participants think, believe that they are playing with another human or a bot. We see that generally people cooperate with humans more. This is in the literature. Uh, there is a good paper, I know about it, I can share the reference. Uh, but you can also look into the different situations. We see that people cooperate with humans more or defect more when they play with bots, mostly because of exploitation and much less because of mistrust. So the exploitation, so these percentages are the division only within defect scenarios. And we see that a lot more exploitation happens when we play with bots, and a lot more mistrust happens when we play with humans. But generally, we cooperate with humans more than this. All good? Now we add a gender. Yes? What, what kind of bots are these? They're not real bots. But the, the story we have is that you are playing with a human or a bot, and, well, you could ask this question, no, because now we give gender, Gender for humans is more or less well defined. The story we gave is that you are, if you are playing with the bot, the gender of the bot is identified by the bot itself, and it's because they are trained by the data generated by males or females. We have a story why the, this AI identifies with the gender. Okay, but in the back end, there is no bot. We kind of probabilistically generate some actions based on some matrix. Basically, we collaborate or defect random. And it's a one shot game, so no learning is happening. All right. So let's look at the gender. Uh, here, players play with different entities that could be female or male, or a non binary person, or a person who doesn't identify with any gender. 
and that person or that partner could be a human or a robot or a bot. Okay. As you know, there is much more collaboration when we play with females. And I say we, by that I mean almost the same regardless of the gender of the player. You check that, the differences are very tiny. So generally humans collaborate with females more than they collaborate with, ma uh, with males. The main reason behind that is the mistrust that we have for males. So the mistrust is a lot more than we defect with males. Whereas exploitation is almost the same as, the level of exploitation is the same as mistrust when we defect with females. So we exploit female players and we mistrust male players. Well done. Uh, interesting side note, when we look at the non-binary non partners or the ones with no gender, they are much more similar to female than male. This might not be very clear in this diagram, which the kind of quick take home message is that generally in our behavior, we have males and everything else. So we treat non-binary and no gender identification much more similar to females. Uh, it could be in between, it could be outside of this spectrum, but this is what we get. Now we're gonna combine gender and human bot identification. And uh, so I removed the data for other gender identities, only male and only female. And this is the, and I promise, this is the most complex diagram you have to look at today. So we have female, female human, female bot, male human, and male bot. The highest level of cooperation is with female human. Okay. From going from female human to female bot, we see that we exploit more. Okay. Even though generally the cooperation level is the same, but we exploit female bot even more than we exploit uh, uh, female human. When it comes to mistrust, Actually, we trust male bot more than we trust male human. Okay. Oh, you do know that the the this number is actually the number of people who selected this. The percentages are the division within each decision. So the percentages, well, sorry, yeah. So generally, the blue ones are cooperate, the ones who cooperated, and the red ones who defected. Okay, we see a lot more blue in the top compared to bottom because we cooperate with. Female. But then, if it's female human or female bot, we see that there is a le little bit less cooperation, less blue here compared to here with bots. But then when you look at these numbers, you see that among the red ones, when we play with female bots, the exploitation goes higher. So what's the, in the absence of the number of people, the percentage of steps that are the the highest of the bots? And I don't know why I expected you to read that yourself. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry that I didn't explain it. So that is that, uh, the exploitation goes up. Uh, if we play with bots and with females, mistrust is much higher when we play with males, but then actually we mistrust bots less than we mistrust humans uh, when we look at the male players. Uh, they are written in words here, we mistrust AI males less than we mistrust human males, we exploit AI females more than we exploit human females. Uh, very important factor here is the gender of the player. We looked into that, but you can imagine these diagrams get messier and messier. Take home message is that there is no surprise there. Basically, if I'm a female player, I'm more cooperative. And uh, if I'm a male um, player, for example, I mistrust generally more myself, even if, uh, so it's, a, it's the same, it's the other side of the same coin. Uh, but uh, I decided not to show them because I also don't have much of time. Let me conclude the whole lecture. The first paper, the cost of coordination can exceed the benefit of collaboration. There might be ways of having diversity without conflict in the birdwatch experiment. There seems to be cases that diverse groups outperform any other group. Uh, and in the last pair, well, projects, AI human intersectionality matters. 
gender of course matters and human versus AI or bot matters. Very interesting to see that the intersection between these two factors, how it pans out. Thank you very much. And again, uh, I don't regret that I'm selling you half baked the stuff because I want to benefit from your comments and questions as opposed to giving something that is already published and there is no way to improve on it. Thank you very much.